It was once home to all life on Earth. The ocean still holds around four in five of all living things. Much of its vast biomass lives in depths that have been beyond the reach of humans. Until now. Deep sea technology has revealed a world of wonder. A world where exotic creatures thrive in extreme conditions, where life should not exist. The pioneering exploration of this new frontier has also revealed a fragile, vulnerable world that we waste at our peril. This is a voyage into one of the most remote and inhospitable places on the planet. A kind of undersea volcanic hell. Biologist Verena Tunnicliffe is one of the few to venture below the waves to the so-called Pacific Rim of Fire. There have been more missions to the moon than to this region that's also the deepest place on Earth, the Marinara Trench. The mission set out from the island of Guam, another product of volcanic activity that continues to boil away in a different part of the Pacific, kilometers under the surface. We targeted the subsea volcanoes along the Mariana volcanic arc. And I think the most amazing thing that we came back with was that everything was new. We've seen a lot, my, my buddies and I are going out to sea, and it was like going to sea for the first time again. The mission would not have been possible without a state-of-the-art, reinforced submersible. it would have to withstand pressures that would crush an ordinary submarine, yet still be able to deploy sensors and cameras controlled from the mothership, floating kilometers above. The Marinara Trench was created by the collision of the Pacific and Philippine tectonic plates. Immense pressure plunges the fractured undersea crust into the Earth's fiery mantle, creating a massive fissure some 11 kilometers deep. A range of undersea mountains and volcanoes loom behind it. The peak of one of the tallest sea mounts towers just 400 meters below the waves. The submersible's light soon pierced the gloom that sunlight can never reach. Ooh, wow. We're disturbing all the crabs, all the squat lobsters that are around the bottom. And look at that. It's just a snowstorm of these crabs. And now they're all floating back down to the bottom, parachuting out of the sky. The real surprise was yet to come. Oh my God! Almost half a kilometer below the ocean, another bizarre sea of molten sulfur. This boiling, toxic sludge should kill. There's a flatfish down there. He doesn't care. 
having adapted to thrive in crushing water pressure. The flatfish also seemed at home on a 200 degree vent of boiling sulfur. A crab waded into the molten sulfur. Let's have a look. Poor guy. Is he going to make it? He deserves a medal. Wow. That dude is tough. It's hard to imagine a more inhospitable place. Yet the searing, sulfuric seabed was buzzing with life. You realize the bottom is absolutely covered by these little flatfish, and they're just flapping all over. It's like little butterflies all over the bottom. The secret of what sustained the thriving community was soon revealed. I want to make a note that a dead fish just landed on the bottom. It was a midwater fish. Well, that's the third one I've seen now in a while. It's not the flatfish, it's the ones from the mid. Oh, look at that. Toxic plumes from the sulfur vents nearby seem to act as a natural trap. While the flatfish had adapted an immunity to the toxic volcanic streams, so-called midfish, living at higher levels, were poisoned as they swam through the rising chemical plumes. They sunk to the bottom, feeding the flatfish and other amazing animals thriving in an undersea hell. It was amazing, the density of them. I don't think anybody's ever seen fish in that kind of density around hot vents before, and a brand new species. The researchers surfaced with new species to add to a census of marine life. It's a list that's growing longer, as deeper, more remote crannies of the ocean floor are explored. Eocanialasmus represents the most primitive living bell anamorph. But that's not what this guy is. The expedition continued along the so-called Rim of Fire, a chain of undersea volcanic mountains created by the collision of two tectonic plates. Buckled, warped edges of these colliding segments of the Earth's crust sustain a stunning array of creatures, kilometers deep. Every volcano we went to was something different, a different community, a different set of chemistry, a different set of conditions, a different behavior in the volcanoes, and new animals and new communities everywhere. It wasn't just the amazing variety of sea life that the science team wanted to explore. Marine geologist Bill Chadwick was hunting for an erupting undersea volcano that would dwarf the steam vents and sulfur plumes. So what's next? Up to uh, fault shrimp. It seems like uh, every dive is more, a little more exciting than the last, so I'm kind of looking forward to the next few days. Much like a deep sea fishing expedition, the scientists waited, hoping to hook a monster. Yeah, well, when, once you know the scale of that, yeah. We're over the summit going down and we started seeing the edge of this giant plume. See it's yeah, on the right, in the lower right there. That's it right there, huh? The violently shaking camera told them this was no ordinary vent. Cool. Wow, look at that. What a great view. This is the first time anybody's seen this. Oh my God, look at that. Oh! Holy, holy. Wow. Look at that red. 
Holy cow. Last night, um, you know, it's just jaw dropping and the seafloor shaking and the and there's lava coming up in the vent and there's exploding gases and rocks are being shoved out of the way and, and you know everybody is just going, whoa. <laughs> so not only are we learning about how these eruptions happen and how they affect the environment, but it's just incredibly exciting research to witness. So that makes it really fun. It was a geological coup, the first continuously erupting undersea volcano ever seen. Biologists were also treated to a new discovery. On Northwest Rota, there are two species of shrimp. One of them is a brand new species, and this particular species has done incredibly well. There's very little competition. Nobody else wants to live there, and yet there's a lovely food source. And so perhaps they've become cued to those volcanic emissions that other species hate that kill them, and yet they go, aha, a whiff of sulfur, and I'm going to go down and follow that sulfur cue. Oh, got a few in there. Big fat one on that rock there. Gathering samples and recording new species, such expeditions are shedding new light on a relatively unknown world. Undersea mountain ranges may play a vital role in supporting marine life. Vibrant ecosystems are often found where seamounts extend near the surface. Nutrient-rich waters rise up the slopes to support everything from coral reefs to teeming schools of fish. It's a process that's still poorly understood. We know more about outer space than the perpetually dark, crushingly pressurized domain of our deep oceans. Alexander the Great is said to have used an inverted glass jar to dive the Mediterranean in the fourth century BC. Open bottom diving bells were still being used well into the last century. The pioneering invention known as the bathysphere appeared in 1920. In 1934, the two and a half ton steel ball was lowered to a depth of 923 meters. Those inside returned with fantastic reports of creatures that glowed with their own light. People were skeptical. In 1960, a more advanced submersible carried Don Walsh and Jacques Picard 11 kilometers below the sea into the deepest point on Earth, known as the Challenger Deep. They stayed there for 20 minutes. No one has been back since. That remoteness, that inaccessibility, has served to protect the ocean from um, a great many forms of, of human perturbation. And it means also that we, we seldom appreciate how significant it is in the ecology of the whole planet. And it's home to the largest animal communities on Earth, largest in terms of number of individuals, largest in terms of number of species, largest in terms of, of biomass. Most of the animals on this planet live in the deep sea. 
Scientist Bruce Robeson has been studying deep sea fish since the 1970s. I had been sampling the oceanic water column with nets the way a century's worth of my predecessors had done. It occurred to me that any self-respecting desert ecologist or forest ecologist would never attempt to describe the desert or the forest without ever having been there. And yet that's what I was doing. He hitched a ride on the Alvin, the first modern research submersible in 1974. The dive itself was a benthic dive. We were working on the seafloor, but in order to get there, you have to passed through the water column and I kept turning on the lights and the pilot would say, turn those things off. We need them for working on the bottom, but I wanted to see what was going by my window. I was thunderstruck. There were so many more animals than I had ever imagined, particularly the gelatinous forms. They were all over the place. They were really abundant and they were zipping around and moving and swimming and, and uh, showing all kinds of active behavior, again, something that I was, was unprepared for. He still spends around 50 days a year at sea, studying the creatures that live more than 200 meters deep. As I used to say to my students, there's only so much you can learn from a dead fish. There's a great deal more to be learned by entering the habitat, seeing the animals, uh, in their natural environment. The North Pacific coast, just south of San Francisco, is an ideal place to start any deep water expedition. The ocean floor plunges down from the shoreline. Marine life also flourishes along the coast that's part of a protected reserve. It seems that every trip leads to another new discovery. Compared to the early iron spheres and submersibles first used to probe the deep, modern day explorers have state of the art diving and imaging technology at their fingertips. On the way down, the submersible passes through the upper waters, home to familiar species like sardines, sharks, and everything between. Sunlight and oxygen support life in this upper zone. At a depth of around 200 meters, the mesopelagic, or mid-water zone, begins. If any sunlight does exist, there's not enough to see or support plant life. Without any light from the sun, creatures down here make their own. Bioluminescence is apparent in animals throughout the water column. But as you go deeper, bioluminescence becomes more and more important as the only means of communication that, that we're aware of. The few creatures that can't produce their own bioluminescence harness bacteria that do. These spectral animals don't glow in the dark to see where they're going, but use light to communicate. Flashes of light are used to emit a welcome or a warning to stay away. Certain species of shrimp can even vomit a bioluminescent irritant that temporarily incapacitates an attacker. My colleague Edie Witters says that 
looked at objectively, bioluminescence is the most important communication form on Earth. And I'm sure she's right because of the vast numbers of plants and animals that create light in order to communicate with one another, to avoid predation, to attract prey, and for all kinds of other interactions. In other words, more creatures use light to communicate than all forms of sound put together, including the vast array of human languages. Bioluminescence is just one of many ingenious adaptations animals have evolved to survive and thrive in the deep sea. Some 600 meters down, the capture of specimens like this vampire squid helps researchers make sense of a world that's still relatively unexplored. But other deep sea creatures are not so easy to capture or explain. <laughs> Definitely. Possibly the longest animal organisms on Earth, siphonophores are carnivorous predators but so delicate, they disintegrate when netted or grasped. The largest siphonophore we've ever measured was 41 meters in length. Siphonophores are gelatinous predators that send out a curtain of tentacles that will capture anything that happens to blunder into it. They are unusual in that they're colonial animals. It's a colony that behaves like a single organism. They're made up of multicellular individuals that work together, although each has a specialized function. A siphonophore is like a cooperative made up of thousands of conjoined twins, each designed to perform a specific task. Like ant colonies, there are specialized individuals who have particular functional roles within the community. There are propulsive units there are individuals that are reproductive elements. There are individuals whose role is to catch and digest food. Nothing like it can be found on land. Experts can't decide how to classify it. Do you treat it as a colony? Do you treat it as an individual? Or do you think of it as some sort of superorganism, which is often the fallback position? Well, it's special, it's not like anything else. We'll call it a superorganism and, and leave it at that. Other creatures that live alongside these superorganisms have also evolved superadaptations to protect themselves from lethal stings and to feed off those that can't. Macropin is a little fish that we have known about for a, a great many years from net caught specimens. When we first came across one, we were astonished to see that there was a transparent shield over the top of its head. Every specimen that I'd seen was drawn without transparent shield. We were well aware that they had tubular eyes that, that looked upward, and it always puzzled me that they seemed not to be able to include their mouth in the field of view of their upward looking eyes. And how can you feed effectively if you can't see what you're eating? Well, as soon as we began to observe these animals in their natural habitat, everything came clear. And we've been able to determine that the eyes are capable of rotating from their upward looking position to a forward looking position. And these animals probably swim along beneath large siphonophores. When it sees something in the tentacles, it rotates the body and the mouth upwards, grabs the food, rotates the body back down, and proceeds down the, the linear smorgasbord of, of food that the siphonophore provides. The transparent shield protects them from the stinging cells in the tentacles of the siphonophore that they're swiping food from. The paradox of, of how that fish could see to eat was suddenly resolved by the fact that we could enter its habitat and watch it firsthand. 
We have been able to bring two specimens of Macropinna alive to the surface to confirm the observations that we'd made with the ROV. It's important to be able to make measurements in the lab that confirm what you see in the ocean and vice versa. If you do laboratory experiments, it's very important to be able to confirm your results in the natural habitat. But not today. <laughs> It seems the Macropinna is also far too evolved to fall for a human trap. Deep sea expeditions have revealed a magnificent array of animal adaptations, and they've probably only scratched the surface. We don't know what we don't know, that's for sure. We suspect that there's a hell of a lot we don't know, and we can categorize it, but uh, there are only a few places where we could say we have even gotten a good start. Until recently, deep sea fish were out of reach of commercial fishermen. Fish in shallow and coastal waters were easier and cheaper to harvest. But when these fish became scarce, trawlers looking to make up the shortfall steered a course for deeper waters. With little idea or regard as to what damage might be done, nets were dropped and dragged up to a kilometer below the waves. On the seamounts off New Zealand, Deep sea fishermen struck gold, or orange to be exact. Science had known about orange roughly since the late 1800s, but basically they lived undisturbed for many millennia until the mid 1970s when they discovered orange roughy in New Zealand waters on the East Chatham Rise. The orange roughy was an excellent commercial catch. Its mild white meat stayed firm when thawed after freezing, and there were no restrictions or quotas. When other concentrations of orange roughy were found in the Pacific, Indian, and North Atlantic, fishing boats plundered the orange bounty. So many were caught that supply exceeded demand. Tons of orange roughy were dumped into landfills. Then suddenly, the bounty dried up. Catch rates plummeted faster than anyone expected. Smaller economies like New Zealand looked to protect valuable roughy fisheries by setting quotas. Air patrols were deployed to enforce protection within national boundaries. Despite moves to regulate orange roughy fishing, numbers continued to plunge towards collapse. All of a sudden, those who plundered the orange roughy without regard for potential consequences wanted to know more. There was a very steep learning curve for science in the 1980s, and it wasn't until the early, well, the late 80s and the early 1990s that we began to discover important aspects of their biology. Profits had been more important than regard or respect for marine biology. Almost nothing was known about the orange roughy, except that it congregated around a kilometer deep. Quotas were based on what was known about fast-growing, shallow-water species. It was a devastating assumption. The average adult orange roughy turned out to be much, much older than anyone expected. So the way we actually age them is to use uh, bones in their body, and they're 
the, the bones in their body, are like, they're like trees, and trees have, uh, have growth wings. And fish bones will actually do the same thing. And so we can use it um, to measure how old they are. The bones that we choose to take are the ones from their inner ear, which sit just behind the brain. And we take them out, and then we section them, and then we actually have to put them under a microscope to see the rings. OK, so what have we got here? This is one of the Cordella ones. We started looking at the ear bones in the late 1980s. And that came in and showed them to live to 100 years or more. And that actually generated a lot of controversy when it first happened. 47 is a faint one, 48, 49, 50, and possibly a 51st one right on the Fishes end. often live 20, 30 years. But the idea of a fish living to 100 years was unheard of at the time. Fish that had lived for 100 years disappeared overnight. The orange roughy was being killed off much faster than it could reproduce. Other fish with shorter lifespans might have been able to survive the slaughter, natural reproduction replacing those lost to the nets. But the long-lived orange roughy could not reproduce and grow anywhere near quickly enough. Populations collapsed fish to extinction. By the time quotas and bans were introduced, many orange roughy populations had already disappeared. The Australian fishery is effectively closed. There's one small fishery remaining. The Chilean fishery is closed. The EU are planning to close, I understand, planning to close their orange roughy fishing from next year. Um, the Namibian fishery has been reduced to a low level, so the New Zealand fishery is continuing, and in a way it was the first, and it, it looks as though it may well be the last remaining substantial orange roughy fishery. New Zealand has closed fishing grounds and drastically reduced quotas in the hope of stopping and even reversing the damage. But many believe it's too little, too late. Others, like marine biologist Boris Worm, are more hopeful that responsible management can make a difference. I don't think it's too late to change things. And um, what gives me hope is that increasingly we see where people are doing a good job and where they're trying to manage things sustainably. We see recovery of fish stocks. We see rebounding both close to shore and on the high seas. Swordfish stocks in this region, for example, have been increasing recently due to good management. And that's really a sign of hope. But he's also predicted that the ocean could be fished out by the middle of this century if existing stocks are not protected. Those who've studied the effects of industrial fishing are also concerned with the environmental damage wrecked by deep sea trawlers. Nets dragged over the sea floor can also damage the habitat that harbors fish and countless other creatures. Deep sea fish like orange roughy stay close to the sea floor and the slopes of seamounts. Heavy nets are dragged over the surface to catch them. Researchers have documented the damage such fishing does to the marine habitat. Sandy sediment down the base. Okay. Coral rebels and Gorgonian corals to the left. The, the fishing gear used for orange roughy fishing at those depths weighs about three tonnes. So the impact on, on fragile fauna, on, on vulnerable fauna like corals and sponges, is considerable. In the hunt for orange roughy, heavy nets were dragged over vast swathes of ocean floor. Yet nobody knew what else the heavy bottom gear was destroying to get them. The difference between fished and unfished seamounts is very strong. Where seamounts have been heavily trawled by heavy bottom gear used in orange roughy fishing, the corals, 
uh, they do get damaged and impacted heavily by the commercial trawl gear. Like the orange roughy, seamount slopes deep below the ocean take a long time to develop. Once damaged, corals and sponges that have taken hundreds or even thousands of years to grow may never come back. Undisturbed for millennia, these corals and sponges have never adapted to change. Our belief is that these deep water coral reefs have developed over, over thousands of years. The growth rate of those corals is, is very slow. We think it's only millimetres per year. So any recovery, if in fact it can occur at all, is going to be very, very slow. The devastation wrecked by the Orange Ruffy fishery is a stark example of what can happen when the deep seas are exploited in ignorance and greed. It turns out that the ocean is a complex, three-dimensional world. If the creatures of the deep could study us as we study them, they would probably think that our waterless habitat is impoverished, barely capable of sustaining life. Exposed to extremes of light and temperature, we are mere bottom crawlers, gravity's prisoners, condemned to live in two dimensions on the floor of our atmospheric sea. In contrast, the deep sea is a far more hospitable place for life. A stable world without limits, where most creatures will never encounter a solid surface. A few broad-minded terrestrials have grasped this essential difference between our planet's two worlds. One of them is engineer and undersea explorer, Graham Hawkes. We're just not accustomed to thinking three-dimensionally, so I think we take our terrestrial view of things and imprint it on the ocean. So our view of the ocean is it has this surface and it has this surface. And if we can move on that one and that one, and travel between them, we're done. But this three-dimensional space, that is this planet. 94% of life on Earth lives in there. Some of us think we have to learn to move and master that three-dimensional space as the animals have. I mean, if you look at the sea lines here, they, they don't open valves and sink up and down and then try and catch a fish on the way. They, they zoom. We need to fly in that space the same way that we have the freedom to fly in airspace and the freedom to fly in the airspace. This is no different. For some reason, it's taken a hundred years since we first flew in airspace to fly in blue space. And I can't explain why it took that long. The so-called Super Falcon submersible is one of many designs created by marine engineer Graham Hawkes. To truly appreciate and understand the ocean and its inhabitants, he believes we have to be able to move like them. Gracefully and gently, without blinding high-powered lights and deafening motors. In the past, we've been so obnoxious, we've been painful to them. We go down with noisy vehicles, blasting out light that they're going to damage eyeballs and we expect to see things. It's kind of silly. So, first of all, we worked on making that sub very quiet. 
And with these machines, we've been getting very close to animals. And then we've learned to put very, actually low power, mood, we call it mood lighting, around the submersible. So we try and probe ahead with lasers, and then we put the smallest amount of light out we can just around, so that anything we get close to, we can actually see. I think you're gonna find in the future, the machines we build in the ocean are elegant, beautiful, quiet, far more compatible with that environment, and quite comfortable for a whale to be swimming alongside <laughs> one of our machines just flying alongside. I mean, that's a dream when we can bring these machines close to these big animals and they're comfortable with us. Such machines are designed to blend in with the ocean environment. allowing us to interact with the creatures that live in this multi-layered, multi-dimensional world. The vast ocean below the waves is still a relatively unexplored and unknown world. Yet ocean research receives just a tiny fraction of the resources lavished on that other great frontier, space. The question of why we spend more money in space and not the ocean, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Our whole future of mankind depends on understanding and working with the oceans. The oceans hold all of the minerals, food, energy, and space for expansion of the human race for the future. Not near space. Near space, it's a sterile vacuum. A great view, what else? Our planet is largely covered by ocean, a complex system that regulates all that we need to live and breathe. It's a system we're only just beginning to understand. If scientists are right about its importance to our future, there is no time to waste. It's not just the future of humanity that's at stake, but the wonder of life itself, the compelling, unexpected discoveries that connect our two worlds. Several years ago, we came across a squid, Gennadis onyx, holding this enormous mass of hundreds and hundreds of eggs. There was no known case of parental care by squids uh, anywhere. Subsequently, we learned that this period of brooding can last from six to nine months. During that period, she doesn't feed while she guards the babies. Once they all hatch out, then she's done with her job and she can die as all other mother squids do. This is the first example of parental care by squids um, anywhere. There are so many things like this story going on in the deep ocean that we are as yet unaware of. And if the changes that we're making to the ocean prevent us from ever, from ever learning those things, if, if all that were to disappear before we even have a chance to learn about it, then it would be a tremendous loss for us all.